Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus the Christ. Let me ask you a question. I'd like you to think about it for a moment. How would you sum up your life? If you had to turn to the person next to you and give them one sentence that summarized your life, or most two sentences, what would you say to that person? I'm not going to ask you to do it so you can be honest with yourself. What would you say to that person? How would you sum up your life? Have you fulfilled all of your dreams, your hopes, your expectations? Have the people around you filled and fulfilled your life? How would you sum up your life? Clarence Darrow, I don't know how many of you may have heard of him, he's probably considered in this country to have been the greatest attorney, greatest trial lawyer ever. He was involved in the Scopes trial, the Monkey trial, you might remember it by that name, the Logan Leopold trial, most of the famous trials in the 1910s and 1920s involved Clarence Darrow. On my wall, I have a wall where I have pictures of people who have been influential in my life, and Clarence Darrow is one of them. I've never met him, but I've read a number of his cases, and I've read books about him, and I've seen films about him. And I've always thought that he was a wonderful man. But there were also problems, and the problems that he had, we might be able to put our finger on, if I just read to you his response to the question, how would you sum up your life? Sitting in the attorney's living room, Herman asked that question. And without hesitation, Darrell walked over to a table, a coffee table, and picked up a Bible. This took the journalist by surprise, since Darrow was an atheist who had spent most of his life, public life, ridiculing scripture. This verse in the Bible describes my life, Darrow said. And he turned to the fifth chapter of Luke, the fifth verse. Remember the scene where the disciples are fishing and Jesus asks them the question whether they have caught anything. Darrow changed the we to I and stated, I have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. He closed the Bible, put it back on the coffee table, and looked him straight in the face. I've lived a life without purpose, without meaning, without direction. I don't know where I came from, and I don't know what I'm doing here. And worst of all, I don't know what's going to happen to me when I punch out. How would you sum up your life? All of us in our lives, I'm convinced, have had quests, we've had desires, we've had hopes, we've had people that we've been disappointed in and people that we've enjoyed. Most of us at one time or another, as we were younger, but it's not just limited to young people, it's also older people, regardless of the age, have faced a situation where they have wondered what their life really was all about. What is it all about? What are we supposed to do? How many of you heard of al -Kalan? Now, Kaline was probably considered one of the greatest outfielders, the Detroit Tigers. His whole career was spent there. He spent 22 years playing baseball. He was in the Hall of Fame, and they had a huge dinner of recognition for him, attended by 2,500 people. And when Kaline was asked a similar kind of question, he said the following, There must be something more to life than this, chasing a lot of fly balls, getting a lot of base hits, making more money than you can spend. There's got to be more to life than this. Have you ever thought that there has to be more to your life than just the successes that you've had, just the relationships that you've had, as important as they might be? Have you ever been in a quest for something that would make a significant contribution? Have you ever tried to think about your life in terms of what you would actually say about your life in 50 years when you're asked that same question. Many of us avoid questions like that because we just sort of go on day after day after day, living our life, not really asking the question, what is it that God would have us do? But there is a quest that each of us in one way or another has tried to fulfill. A quest to live a life 
that has not just momentary fleeting meaning, but a life that really meets the needs of other people and honors and glorifies our Lord. You see, I'm convinced that we in our world today have lost the sense of heroes and have lost the sense of what it means to live. If there's no right and wrong, if we live our lives only by trying to get one right against another right, there's a world which cannot afford heroes. Because how can you be a hero in a world where everything is relative? How can you be a hero in a world where there is no meaning attached, no ultimate meaning attached to anything? I'm convinced that we can. But scripture tells us something different about the world that we live in and about the life that we can live. Scripture tells us that we are able to live a life that actually has meaning. And the way the scripture talks about it in this particular passage that we read, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me as the scripture is, and out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In other words, what scripture tells us, regardless of how mundane your life can be today, or can be viewed today, your life can be a life out of which waters, living waters can flow. They can overflow out of your life. Have you ever thought of yourself as a person out of whom living water can flow for other people? Scripture again and again uses different metaphors, different ways of addressing the question of the potential that you and I can have if we live our life in a certain way. But how do we accomplish that? How do we become people out of whom living waters flow? How do we become people who can make a contribution to the world? How can we become people who are truly followers of our Lord Jesus Christ? If we re read this text carefully, I think we can find an answer. Let me first of all go back to that verse in, cha in chapter 7, verse 37. Here's what Jesus said. He stood up, and this is the scene. Let me paint the scene for you quickly. It, it was a feast of the... Uh, uh, huts, sometimes referred to as Feast of the Tabernacles. They were celebrating not only the harvest, but they were also celebrating the history where God gave the Israelites water in the desert. And here they are celebrating this. Some people say seven days. Some people say eight days. In any case, the last day of the festival, they go down and they get water from the pool of Siloam, And they come back up and they pour the water over the uh, altar. And at that moment, Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, can you imagine this sacred moment, this ritual, this festival? And Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And yet locked into that one sentence, I think is the secret for answering the question about what your life is all about and what it can be all about. First of all, it says, if you thirst, by implication, there must be some people who don't think they thirst. Some people who think, I am made. I don't really have any thirst. My life is fine the way it is. But Jesus says that the first step in order to become this, this person out of whom living waters flow, the first step is to recognize that each one of us thirsts. Each one of us is incapable of quenching our own thirst because we are so thirsty that we need to have another source from which our thirst can be quenched and stilled. Do you believe? Do you thirst? Do you get up in the morning thirsting for God? Do you get up in the morning thirsting for the one who can actually be your fulfillment? What do you say to yourself in the morning? Oh, another day. What am I going to do today with this day? But you see, the first step that every one of us needs to take every day is to recognize our thirst. Siddhartha, who was a, uh, the Buddha, some people call him, a uh, number of plays have been written. Hermann Hesse has written a, a play about him or a book about him, about his spiritual quest for meaning. And there came a time in his life when he heard about this guru who uh, was supposed to be the one who could give him an answer to life, especially the answer to the question, where is God and how can I meet him? And so he 
Siddhartha went out to find this guru. And finally he found this guru in the hills of India. And when he found him there, he asked him the question. He said, what's the meaning of life? He said, and where is God and how can I find him? And the guru took him and pushed his head under the water, which was right there because they were sitting next to the lake, and he pushed his head under the water. And Siddhartha started to struggle, and the, the guru had just kept his hand on his head and pushed him down farther and farther to the point where the Siddhartha almost drowned. And then he let him up. And the Siddhartha said, what were you doing? He said, what did you do that for? Guru said, when you want God as badly as you wanted that breath of air, you will find him. When you and I thirst for God, I might be mixing my metaphors here, if you and I thirst for God, and really thirst, and are still by nothing else, we will find him and become people out of whom living waters flow. But there's more than thirst. It says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. You see, it isn't just enough. It isn't just enough to thirst. It isn't just enough to desire something. It isn't just enough to want meaning in our lives. You have to come to whom? You have to come to Jesus. You see, it's so easy for us to say, yes, I really want to know what the meaning of life is. I really am seeking God and I want to know what He is. And we sort of stay vague and we sort of well, really never zero in on the truth. But the truth is, as Jesus said, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life. We have to come to Jesus, not some other way. All of us have the tendency to try to quench our thirst by either, by one or more of the following ways. We, we either want to become successful, and we feel that if we can become successful, then we will have the answer to the question about the meaning of life. Or some of us think that if we went to therapy and go into therapy, then the therapy will probably help us to find ourselves and know who we are. And I'm not against success and I'm not against therapists, but I am against the notion that we think that any one of those actually holds the answer to the deepest question that we ask because we know from Scripture that only Jesus has that answer. And so regardless of whether we go for therapy or success or right now education is the answer. Education is supposed to answer all of our questions. If you have a problem, if you're a nation that is that is backwards or that is in the third world country or considered backwards, then of course if we get an educational system, then we'll be able to answer all the questions. And Bible, and I think our own experiences will tell us that as good as any of those answers might be, if we go there alone for an answer to the ultimate question, we will be disappointed. Because only Jesus is the answer to that question. But it's not just if you thirst and if you come to Jesus, there's something else here. We've got to drink. It says if you are thirsty, if anyone is thirsty, then him come to me and drink. You see, we have to fill ourselves with what God has given us. We have to incorporate, we have to allow God to fill us, the Holy Spirit to fill us. As Galatians, Paul says, in Galatians, he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. We have to actually drink, and we have to drink from Jesus. Jim Collins, who wrote a book, that perhaps some of you have read his book, on uh, uh, Good to Great, he is a <coughs> consultant for major corporations, and he and one of his staff members studied 1,400 different corporations in this country. And they came up with the 11 that qualified for what he considered to be a great corporation. And in the process of doing this study, he discovered that you and I and these corporations, and you and I, I think, uh, can apply this to ourselves, so easily are satisfied by what is good. Never really going after what is great. We can be so satisfied with the way that our life exists that we never really go after what is great. 
We can be so satisfied that we drink from all sorts of wonderful ways of fulfilling or, or attempting to quench our thirst, when in reality, we avoid the one person who can really quench our thirst, who can really satisfy our needs. So if you're thirsty, and if you come, and if you come to Jesus, if you drink. Then, as a believer, because that's what it takes, that's what it means to be a believer in, Saint, in the gospel according to St. John. So praise our confidence and trust in him. If you do that, then you will be people who, and then we will be people out of whom water overflows. You know, it's interesting. Because implicit in that statement is not only that we are filled with Thirsty, come to him, we are filled with water, but then it overflows to other people. I'm reading a book right now called Contagious. And one of the things that, is, that the author of this book states is that we have contagious messages from the time we're little children. We want to express ourselves and share things. How many of you have had children and they've done a drawing, for example, or, or put together a little puzzle or Glued uh, macaroni on a, on a piece of paper. And what is the first thing that the child does when he's finished? He comes to his parents or his brothers, sisters, and says, Look what I've done. He can't help himself but to share what is important to him. Or if something is really unique in your life, or if you've accomplished something, if you've accomplished something in sports, or if you've accomplished something in your education, you know, you want to share that. We want to share exciting things. Well, if you find out interesting facts, like, did you know that kangaroos can't walk backwards? It's an interesting fact. Well, does it have any meaning? No, but it's the kind of thing that, you know, cocktail parties and other parties you might want to share. Why? Because by nature, we want to share with other people the good things and the bad things that happen to us. You see, that's evangelism. That's what evangelism is all about. You see, implicit, almost explicit in that text is the whole notion that when we quench our thirst, that we're going to share that with other people. That we uh, that it's a remarkable. Just look at listen to the word. It's a remarkable event. In other words, it's a, an event that we want to remark about. That we want to talk about. We can help ourselves. Is Jesus so alive? Has he quenched your thirst so much that you cannot help but want to talk about him? And your quest for life, if your quest for life has been answered. That you want to live a victorious life. So if you're thirsty, and if you come, and if you drink, and if you share, then you're living a life according to Scripture, which is a life filled with the Holy Spirit. You know the dead, you know where the Dead Sea is a Dead Sea? Because it has water running into it and nothing running out. It has water running into it constantly from all sorts of different sources and nothing running out. And the danger with our faith is that we can have water, spiritual water, running into us but nothing running out. And Jesus challenges us to let the waters run out. Be over, to be filled with the Spirit. Let, let me see if I can, if I can illustrate this. I, I got this from D.L. Moody, not personally. But D.L. Moody read, did this one time in, in one of the uh, congregations that he preached. What is this? What? Glass. Glass, okay. This is, this is audience participation time. <laughs> what is this? Congregation participation. Is it empty or full? Pardon? Empty. Who says empty? Who says full? Pardon? It's air in it. Aha. Uh -huh. There's air in it. Right? How do I get this air out? How can I get the air out? Blowing it? We did that once in a restaurant. We ordered some wine, and the guy, the waiter, got the glass, and we could see him, you know, breathing into the glass and then wiping it out. <laughs> what do you do? Well, air in it. How do you get the air out? Put it upside down? Will that do it? Wait. Is the air out now? No. Sideways? 
secure, we're going to suck the air out and we do that, we're going to bring it on the step. If we did that, well, what Moody did is what I'm going to do. That there's only one way to get the air out. to break the glass. <laughs> no. Is there any air left in there? then go on to say, our life is just like that glass. The air, again we're mixing metaphors between the stolen sermon and this, but the air represents the sinfulness in our lives and all the problems and all the questions. And the only way that you can get all of those things out of your life is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as Paul tells us in Ephesians and other places, we have to be filled again and again and again. If there's nothing that you take away from this sermon other than the simple illustration, remember, when you're having problems, when you're having difficulties, when there are times when you feel that your sin is just overcoming your life, when you find that there's nothing in your life, or it appears that there's nothing in your life, the Holy Spirit is always as we read in the Pentecost story, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Everyone here who has been baptized or who has accepted Jesus and believes in Him has been filled with the Holy Spirit and we can ask Him to fill us again and again and again and overtake those areas in our lives that we try to keep from Him. If you're thirsty, come. Come to Jesus. Drink. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And your request for 